Amen. Hey, Merry Christmas, y'all. Merry Christmas. Go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. And uh, Merry Christmas. My name is Gavin. I get the joy of serving as one of the pastors at City Light Church. And this is our first gathering in the new digs in West Omaha, everybody. So welcome. Our first Christmas gathering. Our first Christmas Eve. You, uh, yeah, it's not the very first one. We've been here for a few months. But this is a fun moment and a special moment because we are here tonight to celebrate that we have a God who is real, who loves us, who has come to visit us, to rescue us from our sin. Some 2,000 years ago, a baby was born in a small town, relatively obscure place on our planet, middle of the Middle East. He was born in a manger, but that baby was not just any ordinary baby. He was Savior, Lord, God, King, and Christ who broke into space and time to ransom us back, to rescue us. Tonight we celebrate that this is absolute history. And at City Light, I just need to let you know if you're new, we love Jesus, we worship Jesus, we celebrate Jesus, we follow Jesus, we abide in Jesus, and so we get pretty excited about the birth of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Some of you are with me. Some of you, you have joy in your heart. It's just not on your face yet. So if you could tell your heart to tell your face that Jesus came and we are here to worship and celebrate, that would do me a great service. Hey, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Matthew. We're going to be in chapter one tonight. And I want you to know I really am going to kill two birds with one stone tonight. I'm going to do two things. Number one, I want to get us into the text. I want to see from God's word, uh, the truth of God's arrival into this planet as the person Jesus. So we're going to walk through Matthew's account of the Christmas story. But number two, I'm actually kicking off a brand new series. So uh, next, this morning or this evening, we're going to be in Matthew chapter one. Next week, we're going to be in Matthew chapter two. The Sunday after that, we're going to be in Matthew chapter three. And for 20 some weeks between now and Easter, we're going to, we're going to keep our noses in this book. And we're going to look not only at Jesus's birth, but also his life, his teaching, his ultimate death and his resurrection. And uh, we'd encourage you to come back as we look at this biography written by a man who knew Jesus very well, one of his best friends, Matthew. And so, um, I want to apologize for my voice tonight. I was sick all week with a sore throat, and then I got a little excited in the, in the last hour uh, declaring the good news of Jesus. So pray for my voice as we work through this text together tonight. And I also want to let you know... Um, I want, I want you to keep your, your brain dialed in. Sometimes in Christmas Eve, there's so much nostalgia. There's poinsettias up here. Poinsettia, poinsettia. We're going poinsettia. We got candles. Y'all look good. There's ham in the oven. But as I kick off this series, I, I want us to engage our minds in a worshipful tonight, tonight. To not just look at the events of the Christmas story, but to actually dig into some of the theology of the Christmas story. What are the events that, that Matthew recorded teach us about who God is and who we are and the good news of his gospel that he has come for us? And so here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to take a look at um, the narrative account, which starts in verse 18, goes to verse 25. And uh, I'm actually going to divide our time this way. We're going we're gonna to zoom in. We're going to look at three different characters that we see in Matthew's account of the gospel. And it might have been the Navy suit, but I felt rather Baptist this week. And so uh, the three titles of these three characters all start with S. So we got a little, a little uh, Baptist, uh, what do you call it? Help me out. Where do they all start with the same letter? Alliteration, thank you. I'm going to better stick to my sermon. We're not going to get out of here in time for the ham. So uh, here we go. I'm going to get right into the text. Let me reread the whole thing, and then we'll look at these characters one at a time. Starting at verse 18, it says this. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. I need to pause one time, and then I'll get through it, I promise. I want you to notice the way that Matthew sets this up. He leaves no room for understanding the birth of Jesus and anything less than factual history. Okay, I want you to notice Matthew saying, this is how it happened. Furthermore, the 17 verses before this, Matthew lays out the whole uh, genealogical lineage of Jesus's biological mother and adopted father that culminates in the person of Jesus and who he is. And I say that to say that, that Matthew is going out of his way to show us this is history. 
Okay, Matthew is a man that knew Jesus, that walked with Jesus, learned from Jesus, and he's recording the historical events of Jesus in this book for us. So he doesn't present this as folklore, religious fantasy, but this is history, and it has great implications for us. All right, we keep going. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. The first of the three characters I want us to turn our attention to this evening is that of the surrogate. The surrogate, the adopted father of Jesus Christ. Matthew, the gospel writer, is unique from the other gospels, Mark, Luke, and John, in that Matthew is the only one that really examines the birth account of Jesus primarily through the lens of Jesus' adopted father. So it's Joseph who hears from Mary. It's Joseph who hears from the angel. It's Joseph who, at the end of the story, is celebrated for his faith. And this is unique in Matthew. You think about the Christmas story. Other than Jesus, who usually gets the attention of Christmas? Well, other than Jesus, Mary, it's the angels, it's the wise men, it's the star. It could be a thousand other things, but we don't often consider Joseph. Joseph is like me as the introvert at a party. Like I just kind of sit in the corner, no one really talks to me, and I don't add much to the event. But Matthew's different. He brings him right in front and center. And so we get to examine the Christmas story through the lens of um, Joseph. So here's what I want to do. Let me highlight Two insights that we learn about the Christmas story from Joseph, the surrogate father. First one is this. Matthew, I want you to see, is lifting up Joseph as a sort of model of faith and obedience. Of course, in the Christmas story, we know that that Joseph isn't the object of our worship and our faith, but he is a good um, picture of what our faith and our worship should look like. Uh, Let me put it this way. I want you to put yourself in Joseph's shoes for just a moment. Imagine that you... um, are likely early in your early 20s, you're planning an upcoming wedding with a young gal from your hometown that you love very much. Now, verse 18 says that they were betrothed. Real quick, not many of us in this room have ever been betrothed, so let me unpack that, okay? In our culture, we have dating, engagement, and marriage. It's kind of a one, two, three process. In this culture, you had engagement. That's step one. Oftentimes, uh, it was uh, set up by mom and dad. Step number two is betrothal, wherein you enter into a legally binding commitment toward one another, usually a 12-month period wherein the guy would establish his house, He would work hard. He would prepare a home to enter into as a married couple. And step three was the official covenant marriage vows, wherein the marriage would be consummated and the full benefits of marriage would be enjoyed. But that didn't happen in betrothal and, you know, family Sunday. I'm being careful here. That's the uh, situation that Joseph is in in this moment. Mary is still living under the protection and provision of mom and dad. Joseph is excited, planning the wedding, awaiting for this eager moment. He loves Mary. He has pursued Mary in purity. He likes it and he put a ring on it. And so he's done everything right up up into this moment. And then Mary says, hey, Joe, we need to talk. Joe's probably thinking, oh no, what do you want to spend on the reception now? You know, it's like a new reception hall. What, What do you want to talk about? And then she drops the bomb, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Now imagine what's swirling around in his head in this moment. He has pursued her impurity. He knows how this works and things are not adding up in his mind. And in that announcement, um, things just got really bad. And then she says, no, 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 Joe, I, 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 can, I can explain. See, God visited me through an angel and told me that he put a special baby in my womb. 
Joseph's thinking, okay, it just went from really bad to really bizarre. And he's now got to wrestle through, what am I going to do in this moment? Imagine how he's feeling, betrayed, confused, shocked, maybe hurt. But now he has a decision to make. Verse 19 says that Joseph doesn't want to put her to shame. He's not going to make a big deal about it. He's going to get out of the legally binding betrothal quietly and move on with his life. Loves Mary, feels hurt by Mary, but they're going to part ways. That is until verse 20 happens. What happens in verse 20? In verse 20, an angel, it says, appears to Joseph in a dream. And we're going to read that in a moment. The angel confirms that that Mary's story is true and tells him to take Mary as his wife and to be a father to the baby. And look what Joseph does immediately in verse 24. It says, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. What an example to us. Joseph shows us something in this moment. He knows full well that the world may not believe him, and yet he honors Mary, he obeys God, and he takes Mary to be his wife. He knows in a small, highly religious town what the narrative is going to be played out. Mary, or, uh, Joseph married an unfaithful woman and raised a child that wasn't his. But you know what? Joseph says, God, you can have my reputation. You can have my whole life. I'm going to obey, trust, and follow you. And in so doing, he gets the great joy of being the surrogate father to the son of God, Jesus Christ. Joseph is an incredible example to us in this way. We can live in that exact same tension. Did you know that? Maybe you've never been engaged to someone who had a Holy Spirit, you know, baby inside of her. But I think we all live in those moments where we know what God is telling us to do, where we know clearly what a picture of obedience looks like, and yet we know that that obedience is going to cost us something. It's going to cost us some status with friends. It might cost us a relationship that we should not be in. It may make us look simple-minded in front of an employer, a boss, a professor, a high school teacher. We know that tension where I can obey God, but it's going to cost me this, and we wrestle with that. Obedience to God, in fact, is always going to cost us something. But let me just say this. I have simply learn that the joy, purpose, clean conscience, and abundant life that Jesus offers is way better than anything that it may cost me. Amen? And so Joseph obeys God. He wades through a tough situation with integrity, and he gets the great honor of raising the Son of God. So the first thing that we learn from Joseph is we see a picture of a model of faith and obedience. The second thing I want you to see that we learn from Joseph in this picture um, is, is something a little more theological. There's a little nuance in this text that I want to point out, and I might bore you for a second, okay, but hang in there with me, because at the end, if we see it rightly, we're going to see a picture of a great, big, big, grand, sovereign God working out all the details. So here's the detail I want you to first notice. Um, I, I want you to see what the angel calls Joseph, how the angel refers to Joseph in the dream. Uh, verse 20 It says, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear and take Mary as your wife for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. In all of the gospels, there's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In all four of them, there is only one time when someone other than Jesus Christ is called son of David. And it's here. It's in this one verse in the account that Matthew gives us. Now, hang with me. This is not just a random phrase. Son of David, what's his dad, David? No, that was a loaded phrase. In the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 7, there was a king over God's people. His name was David. He wasn't a perfect king, but he was a good king. He was a man after God's own heart, and God made a promise to David, the king. And he said, there will always be a son, someone on from your family lineage that will be a king over, over your people forever. That promise was given some 1,000 years prior to this moment. Some 700 years earlier, it was reinforced through ongoing prophecy that there would be a king who would become, the king that would come, someone who would sit on the throne of David and sit on that throne and reign and rule forever. And what Matthew is going out of his way to show us right in this moment is that David has royal blood. David 
or I'm sorry, uh, uh, what's his name? Joseph has royal blood. He is, you try doing this, y'all. You try doing this. Joseph is the great, 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 great grandson of King David. He has come from the line of David. Okay, well, what does that have to do with anything? Here's the second thing we see. Joseph formally adopts Jesus into that bloodline. He formally adopts him as his own son. How do we know that? Number one, in verse 24, he takes Mary as his wife. And then in verse 25, Joseph named Jesus Christ. Only the father in this culture would name the child. And what we see is that through Joseph's obedience, Jesus, through his adoption, becomes the great, 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 great grandson of King David. We see him throughout his life come up. He is the servant king, the suffering king who would ultimately go to the cross, rise from the grave, and now rules and reigns as king over anyone who would bow their knee to him. If you were a follower of Jesus, you have a king, and he was a direct descendant of David. And so what I want you to see is that these are not just random characters and random details and random stories that are getting teased out. Yes, everyone is doing their part, but behind the curtain, there is a powerful, sovereign, unstoppable God who is doing what he said he would do in exactly the way he said he would do it. You have to look at this story and see that the God of the Bible is not a small, weak, feeble, cute, fragile, cuddly God, but an all-powerful, all-knowing God who is fully in charge and who does what he says he will do. And City Light, this is not only good news for us as we look in the rearview mirror and look at redemptive history. It is good news for you and me if we know, love, and follow Jesus. It means every word that he has promised us in his word will come to pass. It will be true just as he said. We will see him come again. We will see him undo everything that has been wronged. He will, we will see him bring us into glory with him and to be by his side. We have a God who does what he says he will do. So we've looked at the birth story through the lens of the surrogate. The second character I want you to examine in this text is maybe even less obvious than Joseph, the surrogate, but maybe even more important, the second S is this. I want to zoom in on the Spirit, on the Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. He doesn't get a whole lot of spotlight on Christmas either. Again, we're talking angels, Mary, I think the donkeys and the camels probably get more attention than the Holy Spirit. But he shows up a couple times in here, and it's very important. Let me show you. Look again at the angel's announcement to Joseph in verse 20. It says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Again, in verse 18, we learn the same thing. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So what we learn is that it was the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, who supernaturally formed the baby Jesus inside of Mary's womb without a human father. You might say, okay, well, ducky for him. You know, I don't know how that worked, but that's interesting. Why is that important? Well, it's, a, it's important for a few reasons, okay? Number one, it confirms Jesus' miraculous conception and birth. Number two, um, it actually fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14, that the child would come from a virgin given some 700 years before. Uh, but let me use our limited time and my limited voice to really just drill down on one truth that we learn about the Christmas story by the Holy Spirit coming and um, supernaturally forming the baby in Jesus. And that truth that I want us to see is this, that the Holy Spirit's involvement allowed Jesus to be both fully man and fully God. Now again, be patient with me. I'm going to wade through some theological ideas here, but if we understand it and process it, even this Christmas Eve, it should lead us to profound awe wonder, amazement of who our God is and what he did for us on Christmas. So let me say this. This is what theologians call the dual nature of Christ, the, the hypostatic union. So is Jesus God? Yes. Is Jesus man? Absolutely. So like 50-50, no. Like 100 and 100. Simultaneously and equally 100% God, 100% man. And here's why this is important. Let me give you two reasons. The first reason why the dual nature of Christ is so important is this. Since God became a man, we have a God who can relate to us. 
We have a God who knows what it feels like to be human. We have a God who knows what it feels like to get hungry, to feel rejection, to endure tough relationships, to laugh with kids, to cry over lost friends. Hebrews says that we have a God who is able to sympathize with us. Think of it like this. Um, I have been in the room uh, during the birth of three children. Absolutely miraculous, absolutely amazing. I have three children, and that's why I've been in the room for three. And I'm very happy to be in the room for my children, and that's plenty. Amen, dads? That was great and wonderful. But imagine as I'm in there holding my dear wife's hands, as she's sweating and she's pushing through the struggle and the pain and maybe screaming in the contractions. If I held her hand, I said, sweetheart, I understand your pain. I sprained my ankle once and it hurts. I know what you're feeling right now. Now, mom's in the room. How would that go for me in that moment? Not well. I, I could imagine my wife in a moment of weakness maybe taking a swing at me, you know? Um, that would not go well. Why? Because I can't relate to her in that moment. Those are not comforting words to her. Now, conversely, this last Friday, I was down in Lincoln uh, at a dinner with some friends, and Pastor Chris Hereska uh, happened to be there. And I said, Chris, how's your Christmas Eve sermon coming? Because he's preaching at Midtown right now. And he was like, Gavin, this is horrible. Because last year was the first year he preached Christmas, and now he has to do it again, back to back. And he's like, how do you preach the same text to the same people two years in a row and not have it sound like the same thing? I said, welcome to my struggle, brother. I have no idea. And I said, actually, that's what I've been doing all day. I've been staring at a blank computer with the cursor flashing at me, just mocking at me like, you got nothing, preacher. You got nothing. I got 35 commentaries. I'm trying to figure it out. But I said, Chris, I understand the struggle. I've been there and I'm there. And those words were actually comforting to Chris, right? He felt like, oh man, you get it. You, okay, we are in this together. I understand your pain. Well, listen to me. For every one of you in Jesus, God can officially say to you, I get it. I've lost someone. I've been disappointed. I understand temptation. I know what it means to be human because the divine became fully man. And so the good news of Jesus is we have a God who can relate to pain, hurt, disappointment, every challenge that, that we face. We have a God who says, I get it. I've been there. Did you know that your God can relate to you on that level of intimacy? That's why we can come to him freely. That's why he can bring us comfort because he gets it. He's not just the divine up there. He has been a real man with real flesh right here walking the same earth. So the Holy Spirit becomes the star of the show because he, he reminds us, he enabled it, that God be holy uh, man and holy divine. That's important for our comfort. But here's the second one, maybe more important. So listen to this. Our salvation had to come from someone who was both fully man and fully God. Let me explain. Because Jesus was fully human, he was able to be the perfect human substitutionary sacrifice for you and for me at the cross. And because Jesus was fully God, he was able to pay the sin penalty for all of us. Now, let me back this up just a little bit. If you're new to the gospel, if you're new to the Bible, the Bible says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That means every human being saved Jesus Christ has sinned and we owe a wage and that wage is death. Not only mortal death, but eternal death, which is separation from God and the eternal judgment of God because of our sin. So that's what we owe as human being sinners. Now, Jesus came as a substitute, moreover, a human substitute. He came and lived as a human in our place, never sinning. He was the one who did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And he didn't do it as a moral example. He didn't just do it as a, a great teacher. He did it as a human substitute. That your righteousness might be earned by a complete other, someone else, the man, Jesus Christ. And then when he went to the cross, he faced the full wrath of God. Eternal separation, the full penalty for human sin in his human body. Because Jesus was human, he could be your substitute in life and in death. But listen to this. Because Jesus was eternal God, he had the ability to pay the eternal punishment for more than just one person. 
Have you ever thought about that? How can one person pay for the sins of the whole world? Well, because he was not just one person, he was also fully God. And in his eternality, he was able to take in his body in one moment the eternal punishment for anyone who would trust in him and receive his forgiveness. And so City Light at Christmas, we celebrate that we have a a God who is human enough to understand us, to relate to us, and to be our substitute. And yet we have a a Savior who is God enough to cancel all of our debt and be our Savior forever. Amen? So let me, let me do this. I, as I thought about the second point, I thought, okay, that was really heady. You know, we got dual nature of Christ, hypostatic union. What's going on? I thought, where's the manger scene? Get back to the fuzzy stuff. But I thought, no, 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 no. Hang in there. This might be heady or theological, but I, I want to just pause and say, I think the only appropriate practical application is just to take a moment and say, isn't God amazing? Should this not cause our souls to be in awe of who God is? Not just charting out the debts and the consequences, but to say, oh, wow, the God of the universe, the one true God, triune God, God the Father sent God the Son to put on flesh and become human by the power of God the Holy Spirit out of personal love to save, redeem, and glorify you. That's amazing. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. And so, church, if I could just encourage you, would you be awestruck? Would you be worshipful? Would you meditate on who this God is and the great lengths that he has come to save us back to himself? And so we've looked at the surrogate father. We've looked at the spirit. I want to take a look at one last character. It's Christmas, y'all. We've got to look at Jesus, okay? The third S is the Savior. But uniquely, what do we learn about the Savior And what do we learn through him about Christmas in the telling of of Matthew's gospel? Look with me at verse 21. Context, remember, this is the angel telling Joseph about the baby inside of Mary. And in this moment, the angel could not be more clear about the agenda of Jesus Christ. This is his thesis statement. This is his mission. This is why he comes, and it is not confusing at all. Here's what the angel says. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, which means God saves, for he will save his people from their sins. The angel could not have been more explicit about why Jesus Christ came into the world. Jesus Christ came to save his people from their sins. The culture will tell us a lot of things about Jesus and who Jesus is. Culture might tell us Jesus is a moral example. He is a religious leader. He is a wise teacher. He's an ancient rabbi. He's a moral example for your kids. He's a good man. But the Bible doesn't leave any room for confusion. Jesus is not just a good man. He is the God man who came to earth to save his people from their sins. Let me land this plan by just unpacking two truths about Christmas that we, that we learned from, from Jesus coming on rescue mission to save you and me. The one thing that reminds us is that Christmas is very humbling. If you really take in what we're celebrating tonight, it is a humbling indictment because Christmas tells us that we are sinners in need of saving and that the depths of our need is so great that even we can't remedy our own solution. We need God's help. That's a rough place to be. Think about it like this. Last Christmas as a Christmas present, I got my oldest son, Grady, who's now nine, uh, his first driveway basketball hoop. Okay, so I got the basketball hoop and it sat in the garage until the ground thawed out. And then we got out there with the post hole digger and we mounted it and, and uh, pour that footing down five feet and it's not going anywhere. And we put it up and turned the last wrench and then we spent all summer and fall shooting hoops and playing horse and playing pig and playing with the neighbor kids. And my youngest son was four at the time and he wants to be with dad and he wants to be with his big brother. And I would watch him try a number of different techniques to try to get a ball into the hoop. And so he would stand on his toes and try to get it in the hoop. He would jump and throw it in the hoop. He would try to climb on my truck and throw it in the hoop. And no offense, Levi, but no matter what he did, he could not get the ball even to the net. This was well beyond his own ability until I got down and I picked up Levi and I held him up and he dunked it like LeBron at a Lakers game 2018. He put it down and with great joy, Well, I want you to know that in many ways, we are like my youngest boy. 
Listen, we can try religion, we can try good works, we can try morality, we can try running from God, we can try ignoring God. We can try church attendance, we can try financial giving, but there is no working our way up to God. We can't get there on our own. All of us in this room, from the best to the worst, has sinned against the holy God, and we have felt the consequences of that. We have felt the consequences of our choices. We have felt it in our conscience and in the people around us. We need more than a moral pep talk. We need more than some church attendance, some moral rules, some good old accountability. Our sin problem is so severe that we need divine rescue. We need God to pick us up in his power and strength and save us by his might. And so first, Christmas is a humbling indictment that God had to come. But the second truth is this, that Christmas is an incredible joy. Because if, if the humbling news is that we needed God to rescue us, the good news is that he has. How much must God love us if he's willing to do it? That he would come gladly, willingly, out of love for you. God came to your rescue. God saw our predicament and he didn't send down a self-help manual. He didn't just send down an exciting spiritual leader to get us all rallied behind some idea. He sent his very best, his son, Jesus Christ, eternally preexistent with God the Father and God the Spirit, took on flesh to rescue you. What an incredible joy to know that Jesus would do that. And some of you may still be wondering, why does this even matter? Why does sin matter? Why do I need God? Here's why. Sin is real and God is real and sin will kill you. Sin will kill your joy. It will kill your relationships. It will rob the abundant life in the here and now. And on the other side of the grave, it will kill your eternal life. And you will face judgment for sin. Sin is a huge problem, but we also know this, that Jesus came to take away your sin. And in so doing, you don't just get a ticket to heaven. You get the life to the fullest right now. Real joy, real purpose on this side of the grave. And on the other side of the grave, we get the eternal presence of our loving Father, eternal life with God in heaven. Jesus came to save, and he is still saving people today. Best I can tell, this happened in my life when I was 16. I received the free gift of salvation. And in this room, there are people from various backgrounds, some religious, some rebellious, who have met the Lord Jesus, given him their sins, and received his salvation, and who celebrate those stories of being saved by Jesus. And for those of you who are in the room and don't know where you're at with Jesus, maybe you claim here and you thought he's just a baby, he's a historic figure, he's the guy in the manger, maybe a moral teacher, please know that Jesus is so much more than that that he is the God-man who came to save you and restore you back to God. If I could put it very simply, to become a Christian is both very hard and very easy. It's very hard because you have to actually admit that you are in a situation that you can't remedy, that your sin, which you have, is so great that you can't just live a better life and get yourself right with God, that you need a divine rescue. But Becoming a Christian, receiving a salvation is so easy because all you have to do is just humbly admit that before Jesus Christ and say, I can't, but you can. I have sinned and missed the mark, but Jesus, you were the perfect one. You were the one who came as the substitutionary sacrifice. I bend my knee. I give up on trying. I give up on running. Instead, I'm going to receive your free gift of eternal life through your substitutionary life, death, and resurrection in my place. And I receive it by faith. The gift of Christmas is the salvation of Jesus Christ. Let me end our time by praying. And if you'd like to trust in Jesus for the first time tonight, I would just encourage you to pray along with me. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. And Jesus, tonight, we just want to celebrate that you are a God who knows us and loves us and can relate to us and came to save us from our sins. And if you'd like to trust in Jesus right now, would you just tell him this, Jesus, I can't make it on my own. I have sinned and I have missed the mark of your plan for me. Thank you for coming to live the life that I should have lived. Thank you for dying the death that I deserve to, live. Would you, deserve to die. Would you forgive me for my sins and come into my life as my Savior? I trust in you. And now for all of us, Jesus, we want to end this Christmas Eve by just saying thank you. We want to cry out thank you. You have seen us and you have sought us and you have saved us. And tonight we rejoice that God has come to be with us, Emmanuel. In his name we pray. Amen.